Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for the good news of the gospel. Thank you for your amazing grace. I do pray, Father, that you would help us this morning as we look at your word together. To The, the words that we just sang and those songs that prepare us so well for what we're going to read, Father, let those words be on our minds and hearts this week, and let your word especially be on our minds and hearts this week, that we would not only hear and respond to the message today, but Father, that we would live your word throughout our lives, that we would live your word throughout each day, that we would desire to walk according to your word. So Father, give us the wisdom to do that and to do it well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Wow, look at that. I prayed, and there, they, there it is. It's amazing. Thank you. So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn there to Galatians chapter 3 this morning. And, and as you're turning there, I want to, have you, ever, have you ever received a gift before? And uh, the reality is when you get a gift, it, it's free, right? You, you get a gift, but imagine if you got a gift one time, and, and, it, and with the gift was a, an invoice or a receipt. It feels like taped to the outside. Would you feel the same way about the gift? There'd be some sort of hint there, right? You know, isn't a gift supposed to be free? The gift, it's a gift. And so if there was a receipt with the gift and it was kind of pasted on there and you're like, uh, so I guess I got to pay for this? It's not really a gift anymore, right? But also think of a gift, for example. You get a gift and let's say it truly is a gift. Somebody gives you a gift and then you open it and you say, okay, how much was this? What do I owe you? That's ridiculous, isn't it? We don't, we don't do that. You, you're basically telling the person, if you do that, that you don't accept their gift. You want to pay them for it. And so you're kind of trying to, to get rid of the gift, if you will. You want to pay them for that gift. Now imagine for a moment the most valuable of all gifts, a, vi- a gift that you could never repay. We've probably received those gifts before, right? Maybe a gift that you think to yourself, especially I can think of times when I was a kid and I get, get gifts from my parents. I could have never bought that gift for myself. But imagine the most the most amazing gift, the most sacrificial of gifts, a gift that you could never repay, a truly a gift of sacrifice. And then imagine if you thought you could earn it, if you thought you could pay for it, but if you thought that, if you believed that, if you tried that, then you couldn't receive the gift at all. And that's really what you have with the gospel. You see, you have to receive it to have it. You have to receive the gospel, the gift of Jesus Christ and him crucified and his sacrifice on the cross for your sins. You have to receive that gift. It's not something you can earn. It's not something you can pay for. It's not something. It is free. It is finished. It is paid for. Like a true gift, and I need, Scott, I don't know where the, the clicker is up here. He didn't have it. He, I don't know. He's looking for it. Oh, there it is. Okay. He's, Scott's out there looking for it. It's up here. So the, the gospel of grace, when we think about Galatians chapter 3, that's really what this, this gift is, right? It's not something we have to recognize that the gospel, and so often, I don't, if you're like me, you grew up thinking, I can earn this, I can earn God's love, I can work hard enough and God would be pleased with me, but we can't earn the gospel. We can't earn God's salvation. It's a gift. It's free. And so today, today, as we look at grace with faith in Galatians chapter 3, I want you to recognize that that's really God's formula for your eternal life. It's grace with faith. It's God's grace with your faith in him. But recognize, too, that the object of your faith is essential. The gospel and the plan of salvation for your life, it's not just some random, obscure faith. It's certainly not faith in yourself. It has to be faith in Jesus Christ. The object of your faith is so important. And I think so often we go through life and we think, well, I just have to have faith in something. I just have to believe. No, it has to be faith in in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. That's what we need for this formula that God has for us, this reality that God has for us to have a relationship with him requires his grace with our faith. And so my purpose this morning as we look at this passage of scripture together is that you will stop trusting your works and truly trust the work right? Grace works. And when you realize that, when you put your faith in our God of grace, as we saw at the beginning of chapter one, and you you experience that gospel of grace, the grace of God in your life, and you trust the way of grace, the only way, the only way to be saved by trusting in Jesus Christ, and then you fulfill that calling of grace in your life, then what happens? As we talked about last week, kind of that important application that we looked at the end of last week, then you live by faith. Why? Because you've experienced God's grace and you want to live in faithfulness to him. You want to follow and trust him. And there's that, that faith. And so today I, wanna, I want you to consider three characteristics of Christian faith. What does that faith look like? Because of God's grace and our response, rightly so, to believe and trust him, what does Christian faith look like? 
What does it mean to have faith in Christ? What does it mean to be a Christian? Not faith in yourself, not faith in your good deeds, but faith in Jesus. What does that look like as we see here in Galatians 3? And so we're going to read through it and kind of talk about it as we go. But the first thing we're going to read in verses 1 to 9, I want you to notice that faith is transformational. It's transformational. You are saved and you receive the Spirit by faith. No one changes us more than the Spirit of God changes us. Right? Nothing else can change us like that. And so you receive that Spirit. You're changed every single day by faith in Jesus. And so because if the reality is if you've experienced the grace of God, your life is going to be different. You're going to be changed. And so let's read about that in the first nine verses here in Galatians chapter 3. He says, You foolish Galatians, who has hypnotized you? Or who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was vividly portrayed as crucified? I only want to learn this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit, are you now going to be made complete by the flesh? Did you suffer so much for nothing if in fact it was for nothing? So then, does God supply you with the Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness, so understand that those who have faith are Abraham's sons. Now the scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles or the nations, he's talking about all peoples here, by faith and foretold the good news to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So those who have faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. So you, you are you are transformed. There's this idea that as we see here, faith is transformational. Did you notice the harsh tone that he starts off here in, in chapter 3? And in, in, in there's been some harshness in this letter because of their, their proneness or their temptation to go back to something else. But literally in verse 1, he says, don't be stupid. The word there for don't be foolish, it's, it's, it could be translated also, depending on your translation, stupid. Don't be stupid in, in how you respond to the truth of the gospel. Don't be stupid and go back to a workspace religious system that can only condemn you because you're not good enough. None of us is good enough to, to obey enough laws and be good enough to work our way to God. And so he said, don't be a fool and go back to that. Don't try to work your way to God. In the first century, bewitchment or hypnotizing, as you see here in, in verse 1, when it says that word, it was used to trick someone to try to get their inheritance. And so we remember the story in the Bible, right, of Jacob doing that to Esau and then to Isaac, tricking both of them so that he could get the rights of, of the firstborn of Esau. He tricked them. He bewitched them. He, he hypnotized them into thinking something. It was also used to get sexual favors of, of improper things. And so as you can see, the word that Paul's using here, it's a very harsh word, a very, a very offensive word to say, you guys are doing something that's wicked, that's evil, that's, that's wrong. So this was not a good thing that Paul is saying here. They had to see they, they had seen clearly the gospel message with their own eyes, he says. You've, Paul lived it. Paul preached it. Some of them had even, had even experienced or, or knew the gospel even before Paul did. And so they have this idea of that, that you've, you've experienced the gospel, you've seen the grace of God, you've, you've heard the message of the truth, and now you're trying to say, yeah, but I'm going to try to work my way. I'm going to try to earn God's favor. And so they're going back foolishly to some workspace system. And, and all that inheritance language in Galatians, remember we've said there's a lot of inheritance language in this letter. It continues in, in verse 2. Only those who have the spirit of the Father inherit. And so when you receive the spirit, that's a sign that you've experienced God's grace, that you've come to know Christ, and then you, are, you, you have that inheritance, that eternal blessing, that eternal life that only God can give. And in verse 3, he was asking them if they were trying to get their eternal inheritance, their, their salvation, are they trying to get it by works? He said, are you really going to do that? Are you going to go back and try to work your way? Are you going to try to earn that gift that God has given you through Christ? These readers of Galatians, they may have even endured some persecution for their faith, as we see in verse 4. It, it, but then they were being tricked by a false gospel. And so he's like, you guys, you're under, see, in the first century, those who were under a works-based system, like as we saw last week in chapter 2, the, those of the circumcision party, they're under this works-based system saying there's certain things you have to do in order to get God's salvation. They persecuted those who were under the Spirit. And so those who truly trusted Christ were being persecuted by those who said, oh no, you've got to follow all of these extra rules that we have. And so now if you don't truly know Christ and you don't truly have His Spirit, 
Then you're living in vain, he said. You're, you're going to go through all that suffering for, for nothing? You're, you're going you're gonna to go through suffering and not even trust Christ, the one who can deliver you eternally? The spirit and righteousness come from God. He gives them to those who believe. We don't earn them. Genesis 15, 6, he quotes here, Abram, who became Abraham. Abram believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Notice that. In, in other words, Abram was counted right by God by doing what? By believing, by trusting in God and trusting in his promises. This is important because verses 6 and 7 answer the question of Galatians. Here's the big question. Remember, I've been, I've been saying it all along. What's this letter written to answer that question? Who is a son heir of Abraham? Or in other words, who is a child of God? And, and people want to say, in, in our culture, everyone's a child of God. No, according to John chapter 1, verse 12, only those who have received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord are, are child of, children of God. We're all creation of God. We're all created by God, but we're not his children until we have a relationship with Christ. And the same thing that Paul's getting at here in Galatians, because they wanted to say, well, only those who do the right things can be counted as children of God children of God. Only those who, who follow these extra rules that we have can be counted as children of God. And he says, no, it's not by works. It's by grace. Those who believe. Abram believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So faith in God is transformational. Why? Because God does the transforming. Because we simply trust. We simply believe and he transforms our hearts. He changes our lives and more importantly, he transforms our eternity. We spend eternity with him. Verses 8 and 9 as we see as we finish that that section that we read first, the gospel is for all by faith in Christ alone. Have you ever put forth the effort to lose weight through regular exercise and, and dieting? When I first started at Richland, this was nine years ago, exactly nine years ago this fall, and I quickly put on 20 pounds. And I'm not exaggerating, I really did. I put on 20 pounds when I started here because there's so many stinking good potluck meals that we have in our fellowship hall. And I started here, and I'd, we had just transitioned, moved back to the States, and I was not exercising. I was not eating right. And so I quickly got to where I, I wasn't comfortable with where I was, and so I had to put forth that effort, and I had to eat healthier. I won't say healthy, but healthier, and, and exercise regularly to get to where I wanted to be with my weight. But imagine if you're trying and trying, and we've all been there, right? You're trying and trying to, to get healthy, and it just isn't working. And just imagine if someone came up to you and said, hey, I, I've got this pill that you can take. And if you just take this pill, doesn't matter what else you do, you will be at your ideal weight and you will be healthy and everything will be good. Now we know if there was such a pill and it actually was safe to take, we'd all, we'd all be taking that pill. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're not fools and so most of us would take that pill, but we recognize too, that's just not how it works, right? God created our bodies that if we're going to be healthy, we have to eat healthy, we have to do physical activity, that's, that's just necessary. That's the way God made our bodies to work. We need to do certain things to be healthy physically. But you know what's interesting? We see in the scriptures the formula is flipped upside down when it comes to our spiritual health. When it comes to our eternal salvation, you see it's not about how hard you work, but it's about whom you put your trust in. That's what it's all about when it comes to our spiritual health. It's not like our physical health. You see, you can't put your faith in a pill. You can't put your faith in someone else to be healthy physically. You have to do the work. You have to do certain things, but that's exactly what you do in order to be spiritually healthy is you don't trust in yourself. You don't do certain things. You trust in the only one who could do it all because you and I can't do it. And so we have to put our faith in someone else. You put your faith in the only one who is perfect, and then you can experience transformation that leads to lasting growth then you want to work hard. Let, please realize when I say this, I'm not saying that if you're a follower of Jesus, you just sit around and do nothing. No, you, all of a sudden, when you experience that transformation, when you have a relationship with Christ, one of the obvious evidences is that now you want to do those things that you once tried to do to earn your salvation. Now you do them because you want to follow Christ because you have received that salvation. So you do it not to be transformed, but you do it because you're being transformed. Right? That, there's a huge difference in that, and please see that because that is so critical for our understanding of the gospel. When we are being transformed by the Spirit of Christ, that's when we start to do things that honor him in our everyday lives. Faith is transformational. Secondly, though, faith is hopeful. 
And I think we're going to see this in verses 10 to 18. Relying on your good deeds, your good works, relying on the law, that's hopeless. Why? Because none of us can do it. If we look at the law, we look at the, the, the word of God and we see all the things that we would have to do to be perfect, we're, we're far short. Every day we're far short. And so that's hopeless to look at that and just say, well, as long as I can do all this perfectly, I'll be good. No, that's hopeless. But faith in the Lord is hopeful because he never fails. He never fails. And so let's look at verses 10 to 18 as we continue reading here. He says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Because it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue doing everything written in the book of the law. In other words, you're cursed if you're not perfect. (laughs) We're in trouble. And so look at verse 11. Now it's clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. But the law is not based on faith. Instead, the one who does these things will live by them. So in other words, he's saying the law and faith don't contradict each other. But what it's saying, though, is that To do the law, you just have to do it perfectly. Or you have to trust in the one who did. And see how those go together. Verse 13 then. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Or in the Roman world, hung on a cross. They use that sometimes, just say, we're going to hang him on a tree, hang him on the cross. The purpose was that the blessing of Abraham would come to the nations. It might say Gentiles in your translations, but it's talking about all peoples, as we see in Genesis chapter 12, would come to the nations in Christ Jesus so that we could receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brothers, I'm using a human illustration. He says, no one sets aside even a human covenant that has been ratified or makes additions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, plural, as though referring to many, but and to your seed, referring to one who is Christ. And I say this, the law, which came 430 years later, does not revoke a covenant that was previously ratified by God so as to cancel the promise. In other words, what came to Moses in the Ten Commandments approximately 430 years after Genesis chapter 12, it doesn't cancel out Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12 points us to Christ, as we see clearly here, but so does the law. It's just continuing saying, by the way, hey guys, you can't, you can't do anything right. Here's what you're supposed to do. Here's the law. Hey, if you can do it perfectly, you can go to heaven, but you can't. So recognize where someone's coming, he's going to do it perfectly. So it's all pointing to Christ, the law. For for if the inheritance is from the law, in other words, if your salvation is from the law, it's no longer from the promise, the promise that God gave to Abraham. But God granted it to Abraham through the promise. And so in other words, the promise of the covenant to Abraham, but also the promise of the Holy Spirit. Where does that come from? It comes from God. And so that's why we see here that faith is transformational and faith is hopeful. Right? Realize that if you could be perfect, like Paul thought, remember, you read about Paul's testimony, he thought he was perfect before he came to know Jesus. And so if you could be perfect, just like Paul thought he was, if you could be perfect, no faith is necessary. What do you have to believe in? Just be perfect. Or just faith in yourself, right? If you could be perfect, just believe in yourself, because you can be perfect and you can get to God. But the reality is none of us, none of us is perfect, right? None of us. God alone, his plan, his design, he alone is perfect. We can't do it. We're not perfect. And so because of that, because we all sin and we all fall short of God's glory, we're under the curse, like we read in verse 13, under the curse that Christ took for us. See, the curse leads to brokenness. We're all broken. Our lives are messed up because of our sin. That curse that we have on us makes us broken people. And so we have no hope unless... You trust in the perfect Savior unless you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. Unless you believe what verse 13 says, then you have a certain hope because you've been redeemed. You have the Spirit as he promised. Even before the law was established, Jesus was promised. And so he's always been the plan. Jesus has always been the plan from the beginning. That was the plan when the the promise was given to Abraham. And that's what Paul is drawing out here. He's helping us to see, hey, this wasn't some last ditch effort. God's like, oh, these guys, they can't do the law perfectly. What am I going to do? I'll send my son. No, that's been the plan from the beginning because God knew we wouldn't be able to do it. Even before the law was established, Jesus was promised. Faith in him is consumed with hope because he fulfilled the law perfectly. I love how Paul quoted Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 in verse 11, but he left out the pronoun his. If you go back and you read Habakkuk, it'll say the righteous will live by his faith. 
Paul intentionally leaves that his out. Why? He says the righteous will live by faith. Because he's doing a wordplay here. The righteous will live by faith. What does that mean? The righteous will live by God's faithfulness. That's the grace of God. And by our faith in him. And so he's saying it's, 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 the, it's, that, it's that formula that only God could have. God's grace with our faith. The righteous will live by God's faithfulness and our faith in him. We can't work our way to righteousness, but we trust in the one who is righteous, the one who is perfect. He purchased our salvation, and so that's why we have to turn from our sin, repent, the Bible says, and believe in Christ. That's the only way for us to be made right with God. We can't do enough on our own. It's a gospel of grace. That's the beauty of the gospel as declared in verse 13 too. Look at verse 13 again. What did Christ do? He became a curse for us. That brokenness that consumes our lives because we fall short, he took that on himself. He became that curse in our place. He died on the cross for our sins out of slavery and hopeful in Christ. He delivers us from that, that slavery to sin and death and that curse that's on us because of our sin and he makes us counted as right, as if we had somehow fulfilled the law, even though we can't. And as verse 14 says, this is through the faith. It's through the faith. Now, I I say the faith, why? Because there's actually an article, and most of our translations don't pick this up, there's an article on that word. It actually says at the end, the promised spirit through the faith. Why did he say that again? Meaning what? The gospel. Meaning faith in Christ and the gospel. We're not, simply, we're not simply saved because we've somehow done so. No, we're saved because of the gospel of Jesus Christ and our response to believe. Simple as that. We can't do anything. We just trust. We just believe. If a human covenant, as he talks about in verse 15, if a human covenant is binding, and it is, how much more so our perfect God's covenant of faithfulness? Right? If, we would, if we would expect each other to keep our word, how much more do we trust and hope and believe God who is perfect, never fails? He keeps his word. He keeps his promise. He made a promise hundreds and, or he made a promise thousands of years ago to Abraham and he kept it. He sent his son Jesus. He kept that promise. He continues to keep his promises. Notice how the, the, the inheritance language continues in verse 16. The seed, it's, it's mentioned three times in this verse, or even some of your translations might say heir. It's the same thing he's talking about there, the seed or the heir. Who is it? It's Christ. He is the seed. He is the heir. Paul was talking with apostolic authority in these verses too. He was saying something. When he said, and I say this, that's something that, that even the, the most extremely religious rabbis would never say in the first century. That is a statement of authority. They wouldn't dare to talk that way. Why was Paul talking that way? Because he was declaring the faithfulness of God to keep his promises. He was saying it with the the authority of an apostle, someone who had seen Christ, someone who had been given this word by God, and that is now recorded and kept and preserved for us to know that this is God's word. He speaks with authority. God is faithful. God never fails to keep his promises. Faith in Jesus Christ is hopeful. The promise of what's to come is guaranteed. It's even better than the example that we're going to read about in the next set of verses. You see, in the first century, young boys were confined. They were, they were held in custody. Depending on your translation, we'll say confined or held in custody until they were old enough to receive their inheritance. And so what happened was usually it was a household slave who served as kind of a guardian for these boys, a, a child minder, someone who would keep them in line until they were old enough to get their inheritance. Everyone reading this letter would have understood all this terminology because that's the world they lived in. It was the Roman world that they lived in, but that's how it worked. And so in a sense, a son was no better than a slave. He, he, he had the same rights at that point. He was under this child minder until he could, under this guardian, this child minder, until he could get his inheritance, until he was old enough. And, and please realize that as we look in the scriptures and as we see here in Genesis, Genesis or I mean in Galatians chapter 3, that's us until we are saved by the grace of God. We are under the the law. We are under that guardian until we receive the Spirit. Then, why? Then we have hope because it's no longer about us being able to obey the law perfectly, but rather it's about us trusting in the one who already has. Trusting in the one who already has obeyed the law perfectly. Faith is transformational. It's hopeful. Thirdly, then, faith is freeing. Faith is freeing. The law is good, right? The law is perfect, but we're not. 
The law shows us and points us to the one who is perfect. We're not perfect, and so that, that says we have a problem. We're under that guardian, if you will, that childminder, until we can be freed from that. And so let's read in verses 19 to 26 what that looks like. He says, why the law then? In other words, I've said all these things about the law. It can't save us. Why the law? Well, here he's going to tell us. Why the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed, Christ, to whom the promise was made would come. The law was ordered through angels by means of a mediator. Now a mediator is not for just one person, but God is one. Is the law therefore contrary to God's promises? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that was able to give life, then righteousness would certainly be by the law. That's how a lot of us live, right? We think, I can, I can work my way to God. And we try to live as if we get righteousness through the law. We can't. We fail. So he said, that's not the way it works. But the scripture has imprisoned everything under sin's power so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before this faith, talking there about the gospel, verse 23, before this faith, the gospel came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian. Remember that child minder, that, that person that watches over us. The law was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And I love how he finishes that there in verse 26 because he's talking there about, we, notice he says, you are confined to the law until faith in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Christ's faithfulness, the faith of Christ Jesus is, is implied there. The faith of the gospel and our faith in Christ Jesus. And so it's, it's kind of covering the gamut of the, of the gospel right there, saying that's until then you're under that law, you're under that curse, you're under that, but now all of a sudden you're freed. Because the law says, hey, if you can just be perfect, eternal life, it's all yours, just be perfect, this is what you need to do, but we can't do it. And so now faith is freeing. We need this rescuing freedom because we're sinners. The law tells us how to live before a holy God. And the law is for his glory, but recognize the law is also for our good. When we obey the law, it's, it's good for us. And so it's for God's glory, it's for our good, but it does not save us. It, it, rather, it shows that we need to be saved because we can't do it. And so in these last several verses, we are reminded of the inheritance that's been promised. You see, throughout the Old Covenant, notice he talked about these mediators. There were many ways of mediation in the Old Covenant, right? Like angels, like Moses being a mediator for the people. Right? There were these different mediators throughout the Old Covenant. But with the New Covenant in Christ, there's one. There's one. It's direct to our hearts by the work of his Holy Spirit. We don't have to go through different mediators to pray. We don't have to go through different mediators to get forgiveness. We don't have to go through different mediators to get the word of God. We, we put our faith in Jesus Christ. We receive his spirit, and, it, and there's that direct relationship. That's what we believe as Baptists, as evangelicals, as Bible-believing Christians. We believe in what we call the priesthood of the believer, that every believer can go directly to God through Christ. So faith in Jesus and, in, and, and, and faith in Jesus' faithfulness frees us from the requirement to be perfect. We believe, right? We receive the spirit. The spirit gives us life. The law points us to the word, kind of like, you ever have one of those tests that you just say, some of you who are in school right now, you might have one of these coming up this week, where you have a test, and you just feel like, this, this test is imp impossible, there's no way I can get 100% on this test. Or you ever have those before, and, 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 but you ever have those, and then you know, you know the answers are in the book, and so, I don't know about you, but I love open book tests. Right? I, when I was in high school, I loved open book tests, because I knew all the answers were there. Now, there's still some preparation required, but I knew that I didn't have to have everything memorized perfectly because it's in the book. And so you have one of those tests where you desperately need to be an open book test, and you're grateful when it is an open book test because you know that without the open book test, I would bomb that test. What happens then is that your faith in those answers, it frees you, right? It frees you. Your faith in those answers, your faith in that book, the answers that are in the book, it frees you from that obligation, that, that slavery to, 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 to have to be perfect, to have to have all the answers yourself. It frees you from that. It delivers you from that burden, the burden of the law, if you will. You see, and the reality is, as we see with the gospel, Jesus is 
the answer. He is the word. He is the book. It doesn't mean that the test or the law are wrong. It means that you and I are. We can't do it. We need help. And Jesus is that help. He is that answer. He is that word. He is that open book for us to put our faith in him, to trust. And if we know that, if we look to him, if we believe in him, then all of a sudden we have the answer. And it's as if we were perfect. It's as if we had all the answers, as if we aced that test, even though none of us can ace the test. Jesus already aced it. So stop trying to ace it. Trust in Jesus. Believe in his life, death, and resurrection for your salvation. And then that's how we experience that freedom in him. Remember I said my purpose today is that you stop trusting your works and truly trust the work, the work of the cross, the work of the gospel, the work of Christ. I want to ask you, maybe the most important question we need to ask ourselves is, do you believe you're going to spend eternity with the Lord? And why, why your answer that? Yes or no, why would you answer that way this morning? If your answer is no or and this is important, if your answer, if you believe the answer to that question is yes, but your answer is anything other than because of what Jesus did for you on the cross and because you put your faith in him, if your answer, if I ask that question, are you going to spend eternity with the Lord, and your answer to that reason why is anything other than Jesus Christ and your faith in him, then I pray this morning you'll stop trusting your works and you'll turn your life over to him. Because if your answer was something like, yep, I'm a church member, yep, I've been baptized, yep, I did this, or I'm a good person, or I'm not a, I'm not a serial killer, or whatever it is, it's not enough. None of us can do enough to work our way to God, and that's why the gospel is so important. That's why we have to recognize that Jesus alone saves us. And then as we turn, if we trust in him, we, we begin to recover and to pursue that purpose that he has for our lives, that design, that he, the, what, what he created us to do, who he, he created us to be. And so there has to be evidence. And please don't, don't take God's grace for granted this morning. Don't come in here and say, well, Nick said there's nothing I can do to earn God's salvation. Praise the Lord. I'm just going to sit at home and watch football all Sunday and do nothing and not pray and not read my Bible. And No, that, that, that doesn't mean we don't do what's right. It means that if we do what's right to try to earn God's favor, we're always going to fail. But if we trust in God and what he did for us, then all of a sudden, what's the evidence of that? There should be a desire to do what God has created us to do. There should be a desire to walk with him. And that's the evidence that God is at work in your lives. That's the evidence that you've truly trusted by faith in him and what Jesus did for you on the cross and what he accomplished when he rose from the dead. That's the evidence. And so are you, are you following Christ? Are you trusting Christ alone for your salvation? And are you telling others? Have you experienced God's grace in, the, in such a way that you want others to know how great it is to have a relationship with Christ? Do others see in your life by your words by your actions and by your priorities that you love Jesus, that you've experienced his grace, that you've trusted in his death on the cross, that you've believed that he alone can save you. Who can you pray for? Who can you tell this week about that grace? Father, that is our prayer this morning, that you would help us to trust in you alone for our salvation that you would help us to recognize as well that it's not simply for our eternal life that we need your help. We need your sacrifice. We need your forgiveness and your salvation. We need you every day. We need your help to live the way that you've called us to live, to recover and to pursue as we talk about so often that plan that you have for our lives. We need your help. So, Father, help us to trust in your grace, to trust in the work, the work of the gospel, and then to believe by faith that we can receive your spirit, we can live the life that you've called us to live by relying upon you. And Father, we want to pray especially this morning for anyone who's here that hasn't yet made that decision to give their, their life to you, put their faith in you, surrender their all to you. Please give them the desire to do that today. Give them the desire to turn their lives over to you with all their hearts to experience that grace that only you can give. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.